Hi, I'm Saurav Tiwari from Microsoft, and I'm going to talk about uh, PyTorch and the use of PyTorch at Microsoft. Um, so about a year back when we had this kind of the first iteration of this conference, one of my colleagues had presented over here. And since then, and he had used a similar slide uh, last time around, uh, except there are certain updates over here. Um, so the first one is that the last year has been an year of transition for us uh, with respect to using PyTorch for production workloads. Um, earlier, we didn't have being Microsoft, like we want support, PyTorch native support for Windows. There are lots of uh, data center machines which are on Windows, so uh, we want that, and we made those kind of changes. Um, now we have support for training at scale, and I will talk about all of these things in the later slides, uh, as well as uh, using PyTorch uh, train models for production, and how, how do we do that? Uh, so in terms of internal adoption, um, PyTorch is becoming the deep learning tool of choice um, inside Microsoft. And in terms of the biggest selling points, obviously, there is, I mean, if we talk about that, there are like lots of arguments that will be for and against. But uh, in terms of the obvious ones, these are ease of ramp up, uh, the strong developer community that is there, uh, memory efficiency, which is becoming very critical uh, these days, given the trend, uh, tendency for really large models, and then obviously the flexibility for using TensorBoard, uh, which was talked about in an earlier talk today. Uh, in terms of tooling, in internal tooling uh, around PyTorch, uh, we have it across the entire, I would say, AI workflow, uh, right from training infrastructure, meaning how do you schedule jobs, how do you like uh, uh, allocate a bunch of GPUs, et cetera. Training acceleration, this is like CU, DNN kind of acceleration that we are talking about, individual components which can be accelerated much faster. Uh, auto ML, like hyperparameter optimization or neural architecture search. Uh, model compression, once the model is there, you may not want to run inference directly on that. You may want to compress that. Um, inference acceleration, this is relating to hardware acceleration. And then model management. Once you have n number of models in production, how do you manage them, maintain them, and you don't have a bunch of zombie models in production data centers? And as part of some of this work, we have also kind of open source, obviously, a bunch of things. But here is an example where we um, made the BERT pre-training push button kind of uh, approach available on a public ground. So you can go over here, and you can train, pre-train from scratch and get similar accuracies to what uh, BERT is, has released uh, in their paper. And the idea over here is that so that anyone can go and now either change the training data, change the network structure, et cetera, to create better models. Uh, in terms of model training, um, Obviously, the size of models is becoming very interesting. That is one axis that people definitely want to explore. And that is leading us to have support for both data as well as model parallelism, right? Models are coming to a size where you cannot fit, it, uh, fit them into a single GPU. And here is an example. So this is an internal model. Uh, the last row, these are like internal project names, so Turing and ULR. This has nothing to do with uh, Turing from NVIDIA. Uh, so this is a universal language representation. That's what ULR stands for. Uh, this is a 1.2 billion parameter model. And uh, it's along the same lines of some of these other things like uh, BERT multilingual or laser. The idea is to project uh, different languages into the same subspace. And if you are to able to do that and intermingle enough, you can now do zero-shot uh, kind of production scenarios, right? So for uh, multitude of languages. And this is being used uh, for shipping international Q&A models without using any training data. Uh, for question answering for international languages, and this is in production for Bing. Um, on standard benchmarks, this is the, like the XNLI for people who are familiar. Uh, these are the numbers, and it seems to be giving interesting performance numbers. Uh, the last five columns, if you notice, uh, those are low resource languages. That's where the model is not performing as well uh, as in other high resource languages. Uh, but uh, this particular model supports 100 plus languages. In terms of inference, we use uh, uh, almost everything that we have, like CPUs, GPUs, and FPGAs for inference. And this is across a mix of real-time as well as offline inference, uh, mostly real-time given the nature of our business. Um, as I alluded to, because the models are becoming larger, like the 1.2 billion parameter model, we cannot afford to run inference at that particular scale. And so that's why model compression becomes a very key ingredient to our online implementation approach. And that's where mostly we are using knowledge distillation, though there are some other approaches that we are actively looking into. Uh, as there was a talk earlier uh, today that Onyx is becoming our primary driver for model acceleration. Um, meaning, once the model is trained, we go through, there is an onyx runtime, there is compression, et cetera, which leads to very efficient numbers for us across these CPUs, GPUs, and FPGAs. Um, 
in terms of what are the variables that control us, um, it is latency, like the amount of time to compute uh, uh, or do your forward pass, uh, the type of compute or the number of devices that you need to uh, do the computation, and finally, the cost becoming a uh, very big driver. And so just to give you an uh, example, a fairly decent sized model, I'm talking about like 30, 40 million parameters, uh, which is running inference. Uh, we are doing, for one of these models, we are doing a million inferences per second on FPGAs. So this is at a fairly decent scale, I would say. Uh, finally, for applications, uh, so definitely deep learning is providing us with a very strong toolkit, uh, uh, including with PyTorch, to affect a large variety of products that we have. Um, this includes like enabling uh, completely new scenarios or improving upon existing applications or experiences, right? And this includes Bing, PowerPoint, Word, Outlook, kind of the list goes on, on and on for Microsoft. Uh, as an example, if you see on the right-hand side with the figure, uh, this is like the search page of Bing, and almost all these blocks which are there, like the question answering system, uh, which is at the top in the green uh, rectangle, the uh, image Q&A, the green eye that you see, the people also ask, which is like related questions or interesting things that people may ask following the original query, the rank set of results, the snippet that you see, all of these are being significantly contributed to by deep learning models, right? And mostly trained by PyTorch. Uh, similarly, we are working on uh, kind of new experiences. So here is one example, and sorry for the bad screenshot over here, but uh, this is the PowerPoint designer uh, that is there. So if you have a very dry slide with text and you just put it an image, what it will do, and this is the green rectangle that you see uh, in the bottom plot, uh, that it is making suggestions as to you can use those ideas to beautify your slide, and if you just click on it, it your main slide will just change to that. Um, so across all of these, there is a really exciting opportunity to improve the experience for our, for our users. And one last thing I would say is that a big thank you to the PyTorch community for helping supporting this lively ecosystem uh, where we can go and work and do pretty amazing things. So thank you. <laughs>